I'm James Foster, co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy at the Elliott School of International Affairs here at the George Washington University in our nation's capital. I want to thank all of you for joining us today for the first event of our 13th annual conference on U.S.-China economic relations. Today, Professor Carmen Reinhardt of Harvard's Kennedy School and Chief Economist of the World Bank will present this year's keynote address on China's overseas lending and developing country debt after COVID. In just a moment, GW Professor Graciela Kaminsky, who's a serial collaborator with today's speaker, will provide the formal introduction for our guest. And before that, GW Professor Maggie Chen, who organized this year's conference, will describe its storied history. My brief task is to introduce the Institute to you and to thank our partners who made today's event possible. First, we thank our two co-sponsors in the Elliott School, the Seeger Center for Asian Studies with its goals of supporting research on Asia, promoting interaction, and educating the next generation. And in the School of Business, GW Cyber, the Center for Business Education and Research, promoting the understanding of institutions, inclusive globalization, and U.S. competitiveness. Second, we thank our friends on the GW Board of Trustees, the Elliott School Board of Advisors, and the many others who've supported our Institute's work over the years, including Ning Li, Frank Wong, and others with us today. Thank you, thank you for your sustained efforts. Now, for those of you who have not yet participated in an IEP event, you can expect a lively and informative conversation on such topics as urbanization, multidimensional poverty, global economic governance, green finance, and digital trade. Our Facing Inequality webinar series is a multidisciplinary conversation on what is perhaps the main socioeconomic challenge of our age. Our Envisioning India series convenes experts from finance and economics to paint a vivid picture of this important economy. Next month, Rowini Pandey and discussants Ravi Kanber and Jayati Ghosh will join us for a sobering conversation on India's COVID-19 response. And just a few months ago, IAP welcomed Cornell professor Koshik Basu back to the Elliott School, the place where he spent three years co-teaching a huge game theory course with me during his tenure as Chief Economist at the World Bank. Professor Reinhardt, if you ever need a respite from your duties or just want to interact with some amazing students, please let us know. Incidentally, each of the Institute's events can be found on our YouTube channel, IIEPGW. Now let me turn over the mic to my colleague, Professor Maggie Chen, a former director of IIEP and a remarkable trade economist whose most recent work uses online experiments to examine how attitudes toward globalization are being formed. Maggie? Welcome everyone to our annual event on US-China economic relations. This initiative was established in 2007 with the goal of building a leading forum in Washington for addressing issues critical to US-China economic relations and China's economic development. Over the course of the last 13 years, IMP has successfully built such a platform. Our annual conference has featured over 100 leading scholars and practitioners and over 50 panels. The events have attracted over 2,000 participants from around the world. In the last year, as we have witnessed, the tensions between the US and China have soared as the two superpowers fight over everything from trade to technology, from pandemics to human rights. The bilateral relations have reached an all-time low. This, however, further underscores the importance of an independent platform like ours for evidence-based analysis and debates. This year, we are proud to once again put together an outstanding program. Instead of a one-day conference, this year's program will consist of a year-long series of exciting virtual events that kick off with the keynote speech today by Professor Gunnar Reinhardt. Next month, 
On November 10th, we'll have a panel discussion on international trade in the Asia Pacific region amid US China tensions, with two prominent GW alumni working in the Asia Pacific region, including Mr. Chris Fassner, based in Singapore, founder and president of Trans Technology Worldwide, and Mr. Frank Wang, who is also with us today, president of Scholastic Asia. On November 20th, we'll feature two leading economists, John Rogers from the US Federal Reserve Board and Michael Song from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, who will share with us the research on economic recessions and economic recoveries during the pandemics. So stay tuned with us. Now, before I let my colleague, Professor Gracila Kaminsky, introduce our distinguished speaker today, I would like to, on behalf of IAEP, express our appreciation for all the support we have received from our alumni who have helped make our annual conference a great success. In particular, we would like to thank Ms. Ning Li, who has joined us today, I believe, from New York. Ning is ESIM Business School alumnus and CEO and founder of Acute Angle Capital Management. In 2018, Ning established the Ning Li Family Endowment at IAP to support our initiative on US-China economic relations. Ning is also currently serving on the Ali School Board of Advisors and making important contributions to the Aliyat and GW communities. These contributions and support are invaluable to the success of our program. I hope all of you will continue to engage with us as we move forward. Now, without further ado, I will turn it over to my colleague, Professor Graciela Kaminsky, and let her introduce our esteemed speaker today. Thank you, Maggie. Um, it is with great pleasure uh, to introduce an extraordinary economist and friend, Carmen Reitan, the keynote speaker to our conference, to our 13th annual conference on China, economic development, and U.S. and China relations. Um, I have just three minutes uh, to introduce Carmen, so I will not be able to talk about all her achievements. Um, let me start with some statistics to give you a broad picture of, of Carmen's work. Yesterday, I googled Google Scholar, and I found out that, that Carmen has 18, uh, 87,000 515 Google Scholar citation. So it gives us a, a breadth of her, uh, of her work. She has received also uh, many uh, prizes. For example, she received the King Juan Carlos Prize in Economics from the Bank of Spain, the Bernhard Harms Prize from the Hill Institute, the Adam Smith Award from the National Association of Business Economists, the Diamond Finance Award from the Institution Me uh, Me Mexican uh, the Ejecutivos de Finanzas de Mexico, the William Butler Award from the Association of Business Economists, the World Most Influential Scientific Mind from Thomson Reuters, the Carlos Diaz Alejandro Prize from La CEA, the Doctor Honoris Causa from the University of the Basque Country, the Paul Samuelson Award from the TI Pref Institute, and I can continue going on and on and on, but you get the gist of uh, the importance of uh, Carmen's uh, work. I would like to highlight now, in the few minutes that I have left, uh, the broad scope of the research. Um, since uh, the first works that she did was um, on, um, oh, let me first conclude with my uh, quantitative assessment of Carmen's work. Uh, she has uh, been the author or co-author of eight books, and she has published about 120 articles. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, the contribution and main findings uh, in international macro that Carmen has done. One of her first uh, works uh, is started with international capital flows. Carmen, together with Guillermo Calvo and Leonardo Leiderman, were the first to point the role of financial centers uh, and its monetary policy on international capital flows, the so-called push factor or not known 
as the global cycle in international capital flows. Um, Carmen also uh, examined capital controls and policies that countries um, take uh, in times of large capital inflows. Um, she made this literature well known to uh, academics and in policy circles. One of her interests uh, since uh, she started working uh, in economics is uh, the problem. Um, for example, she has worked together with Kenneth Rogo on a large number of papers assessing cycles in sovereign borrowing, the adverse effect of high government borrowing, explaining debt intolerance in uh, emerging markets. Um, and she wrote a book, a well-known book, uh, with, I'm not sure, I don't remember now, how many uh, publications in different language uh, this, um, this book uh, has achieved uh, that is uh, with the name, this time is different. Um, today, she's also going to talk about debt. Uh, she's going to talk about debt uh, of the emerging world and devel developed economies to China. And she's going to talk also about uh, the aftermath of the debt pandemic. Um, she has also uh, wrote about exchange regimes. She has created databases for all the countries about the fact of exchange regimes. She has also examined uh, why developing countries have fear of floating. Um, of course, financial crisis has also been at the core of this research with another uh, eminent economist, uh, uh, they, dis they talk about for the first time uh, on the twin crisis uh, and the link between banking and currency crisis. Um, she has also worked on financial contagion. Um, she has examined the channels through which uh, crisis in one country spreads to another country. Um, she has also looked at uh, macro policies in developed economies and uh, advanced economies and has pinpointed to the procyclical policies uh, in developing countries and the problems that these policies uh, bring uh, to uh, developing economies. Um, in the midst of the 1990s, uh, we have worked together on leading indicators of currency crisis and pinpoint the ability of these leading indicators to predict uh, the vulnerabilities preceding currency and banking crisis. Uh, she has touched every single topic in international macro. She has looked at commodity cycles, dollarization in developing countries, serial defaults, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So Carmen has provided uh, an important contribution uh, to international economics. What else can I say? Uh, read her papers. Um, so, but my time is running out. So with further ado, I want to introduce Carmen that is going to talk about official capital flows from China and the debt pandemic. Thank you very much, Carmen, for coming to our conference. Thank you very much. You, okay. When, when James was saying, you know, and, and uh, Carmen has worked with uh, a serial, and he said, no, Graciela is not a serial killer, no. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I will uh, uh, divide my talk into three parts. I, I think the first is, uh, so by way of reference, there is about two thirds of my talk are going to be on um, China's Overseas Lending, which is an MBR working paper that uh, Sebastian Horn, Christoph Trebisch, and I issued last year. Uh, sorry, to issue, first issued in, in, in late 2018 and has been, uh, you know, we, it, it's gone through a couple of revisions since. 
Uh, and then in the last third, I am going to talk about how that work connects to the post-COVID or the COVID and post-COVID debt issues uh, in developing countries. So it, within the, the, the first two thirds, just I'm just giving you a roadmap. Um, within the first two thirds, I am first going to talk about the rise of uh, China as a very uh, major player in uh, global capital markets and is the largest official creditor. Um, and also revisit some of the work that Graciela mentioned on push and pull factors. You know, what, what has been, you know, what are some of the drivers uh, of China's official flows? Um, then I'm going to transition on to uh, focus more on the pre-existing fragilities in uh, many developing and emerging markets before COVID, importantly connected to the problem, not exclusively by any means, but importantly connected to the problem of hidden debts. And I'm going to define hidden debts uh, because I would say the main issue with China's overseas lending to uh, developing countries is that much of it is unrecorded by official databases. Uh, and so, you know, there is uh, time and time again for many countries, uh, external debt levels are underestimated. This is the definition of hidden debt here. There are many forms of hidden debt besides this, but this is the one focused here. That's the second part. Third part is enter COVID. Um, and with it, uh, you know, economic collapse, revenue collapses, mounting debt burdens. This is true across the board, whether you're in the high income end, middle income or low income, uh, but uh, what it means uh going forward and i'm going to connect to ongoing work that graciela have with katherine holstrom as well on uh the issue of financial fragility post covid because private debts before a crisis become public debts after the crisis quite often so that's the roadmap so let me start at the beginning, let me start with the uh, changing landscape of uh, the last 20 years in terms of the uh, financial architecture. Look, if you look at the literature on global capital flows and global financial cycles, the modern literature, whether you're reading, you know, Helene Ray's uh, uh, widely referenced work on the global cycle, global financial cycle, whether you're, you know, looking at some of the work done by Stein Klassens or Sergio Schmuckler, a, a, a long list of contributors. The focus is on private flows, okay? Uh, it, by private flows, I mean this is whether it is portfolio flows, whether it is bank lending, or but it is private uh, agents. In the context of, however, the immediate aftermath of World War II, uh, official flows were the big story from 1945 till the 70s when capital markets were, you know, liberalized and 
capital controls began to be significantly reduced and we had the breakdown of Bretton Woods. And of course, in the post-World War II era, the dominant uh, official flows were U.S. flows, uh, initially through the Marshall Plan after World War II, mostly to Europe, uh, but then much more broadly development finance and so on. So we went from an era from 1945 to, to the early 70s dominated by official flows and much less private flows because of capital controls to the late 1970s to the uh, 2000 in which official flows continued but were much less relative to the sizable dominant private flows. And in the last 15, 20 years, we've moved into what we call a hybrid system, you know, in which we have large official flows from China and some other official flows as well. And of course, also continuation of the very large private uh, flows. To put quantities on this, um, China's uh, um, uh, stock, you know, uh, of, you know, IOUs to China, uh, when you include portfolio flows, and I will define all of this, you know, uh, FDI, loans, every category of capital flows is around around 6% of global GDP. That's a big number. And of that 6%, about 2% is lending uh, to the developing world. And specifically, much of that lending is concentrated on commodity producing countries. And much of that lending is concentrated in lower income countries. And much of that lending is also concentrated in Africa, but not exclusively. There's lending in Asia, the Middle East, uh, and, 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 and uh, Western Hemisphere as well. But those are big numbers. So how did this happen? Well, it happened in stages. If you look at, Ch everyone I think knows you know, in international, in, in, in the international community, the surge in uh, China's reserve accumulation that began in the early 2000s with the People's Republic Bank of China accumulating, you know, treasuries, accumulating dollar reserves. That is the very first sort of evidence of China being becoming a major lender, right? But that's well documented, right? Because everyone knows reserve levels and from the treasury side, everybody knows, you know, where, where those treasuries are. So portfolio flows of that ilk, a sizable, huge, as, as they have been, are not the area where I think our work contributes the most. Those are well known. Where our work contributes the most is constructing a database on the lending to the developing countries. Because as I said, if you look at the uh, DRS, which is, 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 is the debt reporting system at the World Bank, which is, is the, the, the gold standard of external debt uh, databases, it seriously for many years, less so now, but still seriously underestimated uh, the uh, levels of indebtedness by a lot of countries to China. These are the hidden debts. Um, and those, um, you know, that lending, as I said, is about 2% out of the, the, the of global GDP um, out of that 6%. Why is this important? Um, 
and then I'll tell you a little bit of how we constructed this, this database. It is important because um, if you are doing any kind of surveillance, whether you're a central bank, the IMF, a uh, private financial firm doing any kind of analysis. One of the obvious uh, indicators that always figures prominently in any analysis is outstanding stock of debt, certainly outstanding stock of external debt. Now, if you don't know the outstanding stock of debt, how are you going to do debt sustainability analysis, for starters? Uh, how are you going to do also the sustainability in, in the basis of debt servicing? And have so, so there is the hidden debt problem impair surveillance, number one. Number two, the hidden debt problem also uh, can lead to mispricing uh, in financial markets. What do I mean? If uh, let's take Angola, okay? Um, Angola, oil producer, great example to use because they were the largest borrowers from China. Um, and at the same time, and at the same time when oil prices were booming, issued a lot of bond debt in private capital markets as well. Now, if you are an investor deciding to buy an Angolan bond, the coupon, the, the interest rate you, you want on that bond clearly depends on your risk assessment. And part of that risk assessment is knowing how indebted they are. So if your knowledge of their debt is imperfect, if you think their debt is actually a lot lower than it is, that bond would be mispriced. Uh, also, if you don't know that there are other creditors in queue who are senior to you, that certainly also influences, um, you know, your the, the attractiveness of the bond and pricing. So in terms of big picture, um, I hope I've given you a sense of the development and how it fits into the post-war era. I hope I've given you a little bit of the scale in terms of how big it is. Uh, I've given you some, although not all, the manifestations of how that overseas lending has taken place. I mentioned purchases of U.S. Treasuries and more generally other bank securities. These are portfolio flows. I mentioned lending. Uh, to developing countries, that's another form. Uh, there are other forms in which there, are, you know, FDI flows that are related to debt rather than to equity. There's also uh, swap lines. The PBOC has established swap lines uh, with uh, numerous countries. One of them, for example, is Argentina, uh, which, you know, has had a swap line uh, with China for, for, for many years now. Um, and the question that arises is also, how did it get, you know, how, I think there, in, in the economic side, there had been a long literature and a long discussion of China's growing importance in trade, trade of goods and services. But there hasn't been a comparable literature of its growth in finance. And this is what this study uh, tries to fill, it, fill in. And what are the drivers of that finance? Well, there's push and pull. Okay, um, on the push side, China's growth rate is you know, which remember between 2003 and 2013, it was nothing less than spectacular because it averaged more than 10% uh, over that decade. 
that was a big catalyst to, in, in the analysis that we do, uh, looking at the push and pull factors. Um, a big driver of uh, China's outward flows is China's growth rate. The, the more rapid growth, the more it lends abroad. We can discuss the mechanism because it's, you know, it's a fairly straightforward uh, mechanism, but the intuition is also when China was growing at double digits, that era was also marked by very high investment rates in China and big commodity needs, big commodity needs. Uh, and so lending to commodity producers uh, was a very attractive prospect. Furthermore, because China is a big foot in global markets, global commodity prices were kept very high. In effect, in work that I've done with Vincent Reinhardt and Christoph Trevish, in which we also look at commodity prices going back to the late 1700s, the China cycle of commodity prices between you know, 2000 and, and, and around 2013, 14, uh, the, was was the longest uh, in that in that span and one of the most uh, elevated. So, from the vantage point of China, you needed commodities growing double digit, big. These countries, these commodity producers were very attractive. Another thing that made uh, these countries very attractive for uh, as recipients of Chinese lending and also the willingness of countries to take on debt was that many of the poorest countries had just gone through the HIPAA initiative, the Highly Indebted Poorest Country Initiative, which had written off, you know, wholesale written off uh, the majority and in some cases like Liberia almost all the external debt so the countries were starting from a clean slate if you will um and the combination of booming commodity prices which made these countries seem to have a very good prospect of repayment and having a clean slate on debt you you had you know the the marriage made in heaven or in hell, depending on how it all plays out, because we've seen this movie before in an earlier era. I'm going to talk about that with syndicated bank lending in the 1970s. Um, so this was the boom period. And this is when uh, much of the debt in the commodity producers was accumulated. Uh, now, um, as I said, you know, there were issues of hidden debt. So the accumulated debt stocks that we observe in the major databases were actually an understatement of the true amounts. Let me just say very quickly, I'm not going, this is not the moment, this is a keynote address, so it's not the moment, and I want to balance out the discussion, but uh, let me just say a couple of words on how the database was put together and some of the uh uh you know areas where we you know know we know its strengths and we know its weaknesses so the data was put together bottom up from project by project uh and the beauty of that is that where a lot of underreporting of the official databases are is in projects that are going lending not to governments but to state-owned enterprises. We capture that. Okay, now what is the critique of our data and a very legitimate one which I think we've addressed head on is we are looking at commitments rather than disbursements. OK, uh, and so we have to make assumptions 
and we make very conservative assumptions about very gradual disbursement and so on, not to overstate uh, the uh, stock of debt. We're also very scrupulous in cross-checking different sources. So if we don't have, uh, you know, at least two common sources to identify a project, we don't include it. So if anything, I think our data, uh, suggest, you know, our database estimates of the amounts owed to China are, are, are lower bound. If anything, I think they're conservative, notwithstanding uh, the fact that they started with disbursements. Um, and, but, but as I said, we, we made very conservative assumptions about, uh, I, I rather started out with commitments and made very conservative assumptions about disbursement. So moving on, this is, so this is the boom era. You know, everybody's happy. Commodity prices are booming. This is a very high growth area, very high growth years, not just for China, but, you know, China was the locomotive for, for African growth, Latin American growth during the commodity boom. But as in history, most booms do not last forever. And in 2013, you know, you have uh, a turning point and you have, you know, a slowdown in China. You have a reversal in commodity prices. By 2015, the situation with commodities had gotten really bad, the, the, the very sharp declines. Remember, this is a very volatile market. And for countries that derive their revenue from commodities, you have very volatile revenues. Um, by then, growth in these countries had slowed down and the debt that had been accumulated during the boom starts to develop real teeth, okay? Um, and so, you know, uh, Christoph Vincent and uh, Vincent Reinhardt and I wrote, uh, uh, you know, a paper on capital flows that also talked about the curious case of the missing defaults. Um, and it was, my God, you know, historically, if you have a reversal in private capital flows, or in capital flows in general, as we did in, you know, began to see in 2015. If you have weak commodity prices, those two things alone, the reversal in capital flows, sudden stop may be more or less dramatic. It may be more sudden in some cases than others, but if you have a reversal in capital flows and declining commodity prices, Typically, what you see historically is an increase in the share of countries in default. You see more new defaults. We didn't see that this time. And so we call this the curious case of the missing defaults. Now, there are different hypotheses, and they're not mutually exclusive. And let me elucidate that because this is getting now to, this is how we started COVID. This is the conditions in which, you know, um, uh, many of these economies, when COVID came in, this is this is the shape they were in. So we call this the curious case of the missing defaults, um, because you know, as I said, given the reversal in, in in capital flows and the weak commodity prices, we should have seen, according to historical models, uh, more more defaults. Now, one explanation was the third shoe did not drop. And what was the third shoe? International interest rates, right? If you look at the major crisis for the developing world in the 1980s, you had the reversal in capital flows, you had the crash in commodity prices, and you had a spike in U.S. interest rates, okay? That's the early 1980s, and that ushered in a decade of crisis 
um, in, in many emerging markets, most notably not Latin America, but not exclusively. It hit Africa, uh, it hit parts of Asia. Uh, this time, we had two out of the three. We didn't have the, the increase in interest rates. So we said, okay, and I remember I said, these explanations are not mutually exclusive. Uh, the second explanation was, and there's evidence to support this, uh, work by, for example, Graciela and mine's co-author, uh, Carlos Vey, Jeffrey Fra and my colleague Jeffrey Frankel, Carlos Vey, indicated that countries were more prudent this time in managing the boom. So macro policies were less pro-cyclical during the boom. So, you know, you didn't get, you didn't build up. So during the boom, the government didn't go in a spending spree to the same degree as it had in previous cycles, okay? So better policy is the second explanation. And importantly, the third explanation, and none of these are mutually exclusive, is if we are mismeasuring debt, are we also not mismeasuring defaults? And we have hidden defaults, and we document these. These, there are a number, they're, remember, to be clear, anything that is a debt restructuring to a credit rating agency is considered a default. If you change the terms of the original contract for a credit rating agency, that's a default. Now, how could it be that we had hidden defaults? Well, remember, it goes back to my first remarks, which is um, China's Lending is official. Private credit ratings, Standard & Poor's, Moody's, Fitch, they deal with private creditors to sovereign borrowers. The Paris Club deals with official or sovereign lenders to sovereign or official borrowers, official to official. But China is also not a member of the Paris Club. So it was not captured. The, many of these restructurings, all of these restructurings of China's debts with, with its debtors, um, fell out, you know, fell through the cracks not picked up by credit rating agencies and not picked up in the Paris Club. So there is the curious case of the missing defaults. In effect, when you include the restructurings, which we do in the paper, uh, the bilateral restructurings with China, we see that restructurings indeed had picked up a lot more. They're still off the historic highs. They're not nowhere near that, but th th that's, so let me stop here on sort of the retrospective of the paper and turn to where we are now and where we're going. Um, so to summarize, emerging markets in varying degrees and low-income countries in varying degrees entered the COVID crisis much weaker, much, much weaker than the 2008 crisis. Remember, the 2008 crisis was primarily a crisis in 11 advanced economies that had financial sector problems. Emerging markets, again, with the locomotive of China, did very well. I mean, everybody had a rough time in late 2008, early 2009 because of market turbulence, but then the recovery was swift. That's not where we are today. Not where we are today. We started this uh, the, the COVID crisis begins already with weaker growth, uh, much higher levels of indebtedness, external indebtedness, much weaker revenues also because of the weaker growth, but also because commodity prices had already weakened significantly. And, uh, you know, the 
Low interest rate environment certainly helps, but at some point, even with low interest rates, insolvency is possible. Uh, and so enter COVID, and we've seen, you know, very um, abrupt is an understatement of what we've seen. I mean, when you look at the size of the output declines we've seen this year, there are standard deviations away from historic means, unless you're really talking about periods of war, okay, for the most part. Um, and so with that goes revenues, and uh, with that also comes Financial Fragility, which is a project that Graciela, Catherine Holmstrom, and I are working on uh, because these output collapses not only are increasing. This is so right now we have the visible debt problems, right? The fact that we know countries to cope with the simultaneous loss in revenue and needs to do social spending, you know, with, to, to, because, you know, the, the poverty rates have been escalating. It's the first time, if you look at the PSPR, the Poverty and, Special, and Shared Prosperity Report that the bank put out uh, uh, last month, this is the first reversal in more than 20 years in global poverty. So, you know, the, 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 the spending needs at the time of the revenue collapse are huge because, you know, cash transfers, uh, the need for, for health, uh, the need to provide uh, for, you know, non-existent or very limited safety net. So bottom line is there's a lot of, there's a big surge in measured debt, both internal, domestic debt, and external. But also there is the quieter building crisis in which, you know, emerging crisis, which is households that have lost their jobs may not be able to repay their bank debts. Firms, small and medium enterprises that, you know, have been shut down uh, during the pandemic may never recover. There are a lot of relocations going on in terms of household expenditures, how household spends, and which business, which sectors and in, 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 you know, the service sector is really getting hit hard. And what this means is that balance sheet problems of financial institutions are also likely to be deteriorating. Some of this deterioration is not yet visible because um, of the, uh, um, you know, grace periods and, and, and uh, you know, um, the programs that have delayed repayment uh, for firms or households to give them breathing space during COVID. So you have huge sovereign debt buildup to recap, and now I'm going back to the issue of China, but you have huge sovereign debt buildup. You have significant private sector uh, debt uh, downside, meaning uh, insolvencies. Um, and we know from history that what are private debts before the crisis often become public debt after the crisis because governments typically do not let the banks go into a tailspin and fail. And also because banks, uh, because governments also bail out industries like the airlines. Um, you know, time and time again, these bailouts are not new. If you look at the you know, the, the, the Dutch trading company, We're talking about, you know, the, the 16th and 17th centuries, um, 
you know, the, 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 the end was, was a massive bailout. They had accumulated a lot of debt and a lot of it became government, government debt. So it's, it's a very old story um, and one that is biting now. So now where does China come into this now? Uh, so a big debate uh, at the moment is as as you of course know because as I noted you know the entry point into this crisis was already a weak one for many of the low-income countries half of the low-income countries right now are classified as either being in debt distress or near debt distress half of them um, and so this gives rise to the the SSI, the Debt Suspension Initiative. The Debt Suspension Initiative was agreed upon in May. In the latest meeting in October of the G20, an extension of another six months was agreed to. It was initially a temporary, it's still a temporary debt relief. Uh, and um, the agreement at present is supposed to last another six months after expiry uh, in at the end of this year, and then up for review in the next annual meetings of the IMF and World Bank in the spring and the G20. All right, so um, during this period, all bilateral creditors are uh, supposed to uh, uh, you know, be in agreement to not receive debt repayment from the poorest countries, the IDA countries. The aim is pretty straightforward. Instead of servicing debt at a time of emergency, why don't you redirect the funds that were destined to repay debt into paying for emergency needs? That was the idea of the DSSI. And the controversy uh, has, or not controversy so much as the disappointment, has come in two, two forms. Number one, the agreement was that official creditors, government, bilateral creditors would start the process and that the private sector would join, join in. That hasn't happened. We've had no participation whatsoever by the private sector. Number two, China is the biggest creditor to this, this country group. And there, the participation has been mixed. And mixed not in a blurry sense, but mixed. Meaning that China's... Uh, uh, um, official line has been Exim Bank and other debts are considered official, therefore part of the DSSI, but uh, Chinese development, China's Development Bank, CDB, is not considered by us as an official entity, but as a private entity and therefore does not participate in the DSSI. But to some of the countries that have been in hot water and deep trouble in terms of debt sustainability, like Angola, CDB is a big lender. Uh, so um, that has generated uh, quite a bit of, of uh, friction because most of the characteristics of the CDB are that it's an official institution. So, you know, and if it wasn't an official institution, if it was a private creditor, why aren't the rate, credit rating agencies not taking into account, uh, you know, the, the, the loans made but not repaid to the CDB? So, uh, to conclude, uh, looking forward, meaning beyond the DSSI, 
what lies ahead. I think without being melodramatic, we have, we're in a period where there's a very high risk of a protracted debt crisis uh, that will be, if history is any guide, very difficult to solve. Uh, and so you are going to hear quite a bit on, you know, what are approaches to dealing with the debt overhang. And that looking forward is going to be, I think, you know, um, both on the policy side and on the research side, what I view is, again, not unlike what we saw in, in you know, the literature on debt overhangs and uh, debt restructuring and, and so on uh, during the 1980s flourished as the, the crises lingered on. I am afraid that's a big fear, and I think it's a well-founded one, that we may be heading uh, for a very, very protracted, hopefully not a decade, but I can you cannot rule it out, uh, a very protracted, um, difficult period where debt crises become a lot more frequent outside, you know, in, in the middle to low income countries. And uh, remember, debt crises don't travel alone. You know, with it, you have financial frailty, you have banking problems, currency crashes because confidence is lost. Uh, with currency crashes, you also have inflation problems and so on and so forth. Debt crises don't travel alone. And the big concern is really, the biggest concern is a lost decade for development. That's a real danger. And let me, on that uplifting note, let me stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Carmen, for your <clears throat> fabulous analysis, historical, all the way to the present day. Let me turn it over to Graciela for the first question. The rest of you, please start thinking to put your questions into the Q&A uh, part of WebEx. And Graciela, take it away. Thank you, Carmen, for a wonderful presentation. Um, the detective work that you have done in the paper on China is extraordinary. So, uh, James, I think that we have to institute the Sherlock Holmes or the Poirot uh, prize for Carmen. Uh, I think that she deserves it. Um, so I want to lighten up, you know, the, 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 the black picture of the world. So uh, I guess that... Uh, this could help a little bit. Um, in any case, um, I really enjoy the paper that you presented, all the work, the construction of the database on, uh, on uh, official uh, capital outflows of China. Uh, and also how you combine uh, the, uh, the data with uh, equity investment, portfolio data, et cetera. Um, Something that you haven't mentioned uh, a lot in your presentation is, uh, you did, but uh, I would like to focus a little bit more on that, is that you examine the drivers of capital uh, outflows uh, in China. And you look at the push factors, as you mentioned, and one of the big drivers in capital uh, outflows of China is fluctuations in GDP. And we know that in the best times, in the early uh, 2000, China was growing at 15%, 15%, 11%. Now China is growing at much lower growth rates. And uh, even though uh, the COVID is not a problem so important in China domestically, but it's affecting the rest of the world and it's affecting even further. Uh, the GDP uh, of uh, China. Um, so also, as you mentioned, commodity prices matter a lot, and commodity prices have uh, collapsed. Um, so I would like you uh, to speculate a little bit. 
about um, what you find uh, that and uh, how you can assess the role of China, uh, the collapsing growth rate in China, how this is going to affect uh, low-income countries that I imagine that we are going to, to see that the missing defaults are not missing anymore, um, how this is going to affect uh, the rest of the world. So this is my first question. The second question that I would like uh, to ask is also about the future. Uh, we are living in the perfect storm now. Uh, so we have the pandemic, we have poverty, we have social revolts, uh, we are questioning uh, the, whether globalization is going to persist. Um, so we are all trying to read uh, the tea leaves and, and the future. So I would like to ask you about uh, how do you see the future? And in particular, you have written a lot uh, on debt and how the debt, if it comes in a in high amounts as a proportion of GDP, even leads to a further uh, decline in economic activity. Uh, so you wrote this uh, in the early 2000s. Uh, now we are in a much worse situation. Uh, government debt has increased around the world. Uh, private debt has increased around the world. We have uh, an environment of very low interest rates and corporate debts have increase uh, dramatically. Um, so um, what do we what we expect? And you mentioned, and I would like you to, to, to talk a little bit more in more detail of what you expect uh, around the world, not just in developing countries, but also in advanced economies. Um, how, um, because now what we are seeing is that Government debt is even increasing, as you mentioned, bailouts in firms, bailouts of uh, households, uh, a variety of different programs. So, um, what do you expect for this decade? I would like you to, to go in much in more detail, if you can. Um, is it going to be a reenactment of the, de the lost de decade for Latin America? What type of policies are going to be implemented? Uh, Latin America introduced a lot of financial repression. Um, and the aftermath of World War II, we also observe in advanced economies introduced financial uh, repression. How those are going to affect growth? What are the policies that you advise? I would like to, to also to focus you what type of policies, okay, to exit this conundrum. You can answer both questions. You can answer one of them. Uh, do what you like. <laughs> Thank you. So, so, you know, I think on the basis of the analysis that we did, uh, and also on the basis of knowing um, what the debtor profile looks like, my expectation is that flows from China to the developing world will diminish substantially. Um, if you look at the analysis, the empirical analysis we did in the paper, as you observe, growth is a big driver, okay? Um, and the therefore the growth slowdown from double digits uh, to then around 6% and possibly post COVID even lower, um, is a major, uh, you know, um, you know, is the removal of a major impetus. That's one side, okay? The other side is, as I said, the recipient countries. Uh, a decade ago, 12 years ago, a lot of those countries looked great. They had, you know, their, their balance sheets, had been pretty, you know, liberated by the HIPIC initiative, which did substantial debt write-offs for the poorest countries. 
uh, and commodity prices were a lot higher. So, so their profile. Now we're we're looking at debt crisis. Uh, so, you know, as they're not the attractive uh, magnet for for you know. Um, this is not where you put money in. Uh, and I would add to that that, again, this is based on here. So you have to take it with a great grain of salt, okay? But it's not an implausible estimate. You know, uh, there are private firms that also follow uh, very closely the uh, lending patterns of the major um official chinese banks you know the xm and and the cdb and you know some of those articles are suggesting and again take it with a grain of salt but that is at the moment that as much as a quarter of the of that loan stock is not performing right now so you know abst abstaining from the fact that this is a sovereign portfolio abstaining from the fact that this is an official bank, abstaining from the fact that in China, just if, whenever you hear your bad loan share goes up, typically your lending goes down. So even beyond the slowdown, just from the balance sheet side, I think, you know, certainly the, the, the impetus to new lending, I think, is, is hitting a major um you know major headwinds i'm not saying it's going to zero but i am saying definitely that the direction is 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 much much uh uh likely to be uh reduced on the huge question that you pose the second question what do i expect well let me start by making an observation that you know um in, in work that I did with Ken Rogoff and with Vincent Reinhardt, this is a Journal of Economic Perspective paper that looked, this just looked at advanced economies, okay? But it looked at advanced economies from 1800 onward on, you know, periods of high indebtedness, you know, periods of, of, of big debt overhang. And in that paper and in the uh, growth in the time of debt paper, you know, the the main takeaway is, is growth slows down at high levels of debt. But the Journal of Economic Perspective paper also makes the point that you seldom work down debt quickly, okay? That on average, it took much longer. You know, it took a couple of decades to unwind debt. Um, and I think that's going to be the case here. I think we're going to be in a high debt, lower growth environment for quite a bit of time, quite a bit of time. Um, look, at the end of World War II, the US and other advanced economies had massive by historical standard level of debt. But much of that was wartime expenditure which is far more reversible than a social safety net expenditure. You know, that, 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 you know, you, that kind of, and you see this actually, when, if you plot US debt or, or advanced economy debt from 1900, say, to the present, you see this spike around World War II is indeed a spike. This is looking more like a plateau because you know, the idea that you cut back military spending because you're in peacetime, and that already addresses a big chunk of the flow issue, you stop generating deficits, it's very different from what it is today. It's not that easy to do, uh, certainly politically, when you're dealing with, with uh, um, non-discretionary uh, you know, built-in uh, items to, to, to the budget. That's number one. Number two, the issue you mentioned, private debt. At the end of World War II, 
uh, advanced economies had very little private debt because between the Great Depression of the 1930s and then the war, which lasted five years, private debts had been pretty much wiped out. And, you know, again, both of those, I think, are headwinds uh, to, to, to growth in the private side. Um, I think we are going to see a period again, as we saw in 2008, but in 2008, the problem was confined to households. Now it is not just confined to household, it also applies to firms. I think you're gonna see a period of deleveraging. Uh, and deleveraging um, is a headwind to growth. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's retrenchment um, is how you deliver. And, and, and that is on the private side. So that's another consideration. So how do you think we're going to get out of it? Well, I, you know, I've written a lot about financial repression at the end of World War II and how negative, you know, ex post real interest rates uh, were a contributor to how debt was reduced. So I think, yes, I think we are in a low for long uh, environment. I don't think, however, financial repression alone will be able to uh, deal with the outstanding stocks of debt in most advanced economies. I think um, we are going to see uh, higher taxes down the road. And I think we're also going to see uh, and before everybody starts thinking I am deranged, uh, I will remind everyone, you know, that, okay, I, I think we're going to see more debt restructurings. But if I had told you, if I had told anyone, if I had told myself in 2006 or 2007 that an advanced economy in Europe would be having a debt crisis and a default, uh, after the global financial crisis, would you have believed me? You know, if, if I if I came in in, in, in 2006 or seven, told you Greece, you know, Greece is going to be in default and Ireland, Spain, uh, Ireland, Portugal, Iceland and Greece are all going to have IMF programs. The last time an IMF had a, an advanced economy program was the very early 80s. That was Portugal. So, you know, uh, I, I I think restructurings are are in the most extreme cases also something we can't rule out. And finally, just to be really comprehensive, um, economists have a terrible track record uh, with the problem of extrapolation. You know, we first declared. You know, remember the great modern. The, the, the great moderation, okay? The great moderation was, well, we've, we've tamed the business cycle. We saw how well that worked out. Then I've just mentioned the fact that, oh no, when I would talk about Greece, and now this is not me saying this with hindsight, you can check and verify this in real time. You know, I was saying this in 2010, this is an emerging market type crisis. The way emerging market type crisis end, they end with restructuring. Um, you know, there was, oh no, restructuring is something emerging markets do. It's not something advanced economies do. Now the, the fashionable thing is, is, is inflation's dead. And, you know, like Bloomberg ran an article, you know, with a dinosaur on the cover and it said inflation is dead. And when I saw that cover, my, my blood froze because I said every time we declare victory on anything, <laughs> it's, it hasn't really worked out too well. So I, I don't, let me say this, I don't think, uh, first of all, it starts with the most frail, if you will, the canary in the coal mine. And the canary in the coal mine are the countries that have, are having already debt difficulties because they lose access to international capital. They turn inwards and finance themselves uh, through uh, the cent domestic central bank. 
And, you know, we're already seeing ample evidence that in many countries inflation uh, has been on the rise as things gotten worse. Um, but advanced economies, it, you know, the idea that we don't have to worry at all about inflation, I think that is also uh, subject to the same vulnerability of, you know, the great moderation and we're never going to have defaults in advanced economies and all of that. Um, look, um, in the 1970s, we had a major oil shock and it was easy to identify. This is a big supply shock. Uh, I think in COVID, we're having a huge number of supply shocks um, that we haven't really, we really don't know yet how the dust is going to settle on that. So I think, you know, the supply shock is not as easy to identify as the 1970s oil shock, but they're there. So, you know, let's, let's wait and see. Let me stop there on that. Right, thank you. I see a couple of short questions from uh, Maggie Chen and from uh, Danny Leipziger. So let's start with Maggie. A uh, quick question. and then I'll, I'll keep my answer short. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Carmen, for your wonderful presentation. I have a quick question. In your data, do you see China adjusting its overseas lending over time based on its experiences from you know lending to some countries? Do you see any changes in terms of, you know, destination countries and so on? Okay, so um, I think, um, you know, uh, the a big weakness when we look at push factors, we really didn't go the route of saying, okay, here are geopolitical factors. We, we didn't explore that. We stuck to the standard push and pull. Uh, but you can still see uh, differences uh, in lending patterns. Um, the initial concentration of lending was, as I said, more concentrated in low income, commodity producing countries, often countries that had little access to uh, capital markets at, or, or little or no access to capital markets. So Chinese lending was really the uh, major source uh, of lending. So we see that over time morph into more higher income countries, countries that are not necessarily also just commodity producers, but also, uh, you know, um, uh, whether they're in manufacturing or whether they're in services, you know, including, you know, Caribbean and tourism. Uh, so the evolution was towards a more diverse, higher income countries. Now, and this is food for thought in the future, um, our sample isn't picking up, for example, some of the very recent initiatives on the Belt and Road are with Europe. So I think that trend towards higher income, you know, ports in Greece, uh, 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 you know, uh, agreements with Italy, agreements with Switzerland, agreements with, you know, several of the Eastern Europe. I think this trend that I'm describing of greater diversification and evolution from the commodity low income into more heterogeneous higher income, I think that that's the, the trend. But as I said, we didn't do the geopolitical of who you lend to. Um, but if you were to do the composition of countries over time, that's what I, you see what I described. Let me go on with a question from Sunil Sharma of, uh, of formerly of the IMF, but apparently in the Institute. 
in an age in which governments in advanced countries have provided government backstops to all kinds of private debt and equity markets, backstops which would have been unthinkable a decade or so ago, do we need to rethink our approach to international private capital flows and the oversight and regulation of such flows? So, um, look, uh, you know, um, I think the answer or my, I, I you know, so to, to be very honest, I'd have to, this is a tough question and I'd have to think about it more. But my, my answer is every time you involve guarantees, you're inducing risk taking. OK, this is, you know, an invitation to risk taking and because you're, you're, you're really introducing a wedge between the fundamentals of the underlying and the, um, the, the you know, the risk that the true risk that the investor is taking. So um, uh, I, I, I do think that um, there are risks associated with, you know, guarantees. I can understand very much that in an emergency situation, um, reassurance, providing liquidity is has been an essential form of the policy response. But going forward, I think you have to worry about excessive risk taking on the basis of, you know, you, lend to anybody what's in it for you. I mean, you, you, you're, you're guaranteed. Uh, that's number one. Number two, there's also the risk that um, not all the problems are Ill illiquidity. There are huge solvency problems that are being uh, created because of not only the output, uh, employment, and protracted nature of the pandemic, because we're practically in November and look where we are, um, but also uh, because you know there are big sectoral changes. So it's not clear to me where you know um, where do, where are you going to draw the line between just liquidity needs and supporting industries that are no longer solvent, period. So, you know, that, that's, uh, that's uh, I think, a big, you know, easier said conceptually than done on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think those are two. So one, you can address more with regulation, okay? The other one is more you know, reality time, and it's really about restructuring. It's about, in this case, private debt restructuring, but restructuring nonetheless. So a pair of questions from colleagues here, from uh, Michael Moore. The missing leg you mentioned from the 1980s debt crisis is rising U.S. interest rates. Recent U.S. inflation has been much lower than expected. How much would U.S. interest rates need to rise to push vulnerable countries into a real and immediate crisis? That's question one. And the second from Jay Shambo, also a colleague here, and my co-director in the IAP. Often countries don't default outright because they still need the ongoing inflows. Is it different with China? If China quits lending to African countries in deep trouble, does it open the possibility that we'll see more outright defaults on debt to CHN? Okay. Uh, so, look, uh, bad things can happen even at low interest rates. So, I don't think we've already seen a substantive, substantive rise in debt problems, even at these rates. So I, I, I don't, I'm not, I under, 
let me be clear, I'm not looking for a replay of the 80s in the sense that, you know, certainly, you know, the Paul Walker interest rate shock, which was, you know, once in a once in the post World War Two, you know, um, era. That, I mean, I, nothing resembling that. I don't think. I think this can happen with rates being in the low for long, because solvency in the end. First of all, first of all, this is very important. We think of oh, rates. Look how low. How how I mean. You know, uh, well, you know, they're low for whom? Uh, El Salvador's last bond issuance was a nine and a half coupon. You know, so, so, <laughs> I, 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 you know, it, the, the point that I'm making is that as the frailty of these economies has increased. Uh, this is reflected in deteriorated credit credit ratings, credit ratings, downgrades. Both the outright downgrades and the downgrades and outlooks have soared, soared to historic highs this year. I actually have the data monthly going back to the you know covering the entire 1980s crisis. They're bigger now. They're higher now. Um, so. What I'm getting at is even without an interest rate spike, small, medium, or large, uh, I think the insolvency problems are emerging because of the deteriorating fundamentals, the fact that growth isn't coming back quick enough, the fact that, yes, the risk-free rate may be zero, but the coupon rates these countries are issuing at are, you know, as I said, that the, the peak one was nine and a half by El Salvador. And, uh, you know, the Ghanas, the, the, the Zambias, the, you know, Zambia is now in selective default, so it's not. But even before that, you're really talking about, uh, you know, well over 8%. Uh, so, you know, that's not really what one would call low. You'd have to be growing uh, pretty rapidly to make your R minus G math uh, work for you. Um, now, um, I'm going to have to have you repeat, Jace. You know, just just start no it off and up. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Often countries don't default outright because they still need the ongoing inflows. So is it going to be different with China? If China quits lending to African countries in deep trouble, does it open the possibility we'll see more outright defaults on debt to China? So I, I, I do think there's a possibility we'll see more outright debt, debt defaults. Um, I don't think it will. Uh, I, I mean, look, we, 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 you know, we had not just Argentina and Ecuador, but we also had Zambia. All three of them had problems even before COVID. Uh, we've seen, you know, uh, Lebanon, we've seen um, Suriname. Uh, you know, we, 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 we've seen that already. And the reason also that I think um, we... Uh, are likely to see uh, more defaults is um, the creditor composition has also gotten pretty complex. So it's not just a China question, it's also, you know, uh, many frontier economies, which you know, 20 years ago, nobody would have thought they could ever issue a bond, have issued a lot of bonds. And so that, you know, there's also private bondholders that are a different class of investor from the commercial bank lending that dominated the scene uh, in the 1980s. 
okay? Because, you know, in, in the 1980s, and I'm not saying it was in any way, shape, or form or easy, because if it had been easy, it wouldn't have taken a decade. Uh, but that in the 1980s, you had really a handful of U.S. banks that had gone, you know, in a, on a lending binge in the late 70s during the commodity boom. There's a lot of parallels in that. We make those parallels in the paper. Uh, but it was more manageable to, you know, deal with that than to deal with bondholders, in credit, in, including some that are very, you know, powerful bondholders, to deal with still uh, other private creditors, commercial creditors, China, which is outside the Paris Club, the Paris Club. And so the creditor landscape, I think, is one that also may reaching short-term agreements when you run when you run out of funds. Uh, you know, sort of the 11th hour emergency kind of default, I think, is is um, more likely in this environment. However, also let me say, though, that in terms of avoiding outright defaults, that had been, up until recently, that had been the norm with Chinese lending. You had restructuring. Uh, the, the typical restructuring does not involve any face value, face value write-offs. It involves some lengthening of maturity. It involves some, uh, uh, you know, grace period often on uh, principal, although not on interest. It usually leaves the terms, i.e., the interest rate unchanged. But there is. Um, you know, there is some restructuring, sometimes tied to some new money, others not. But I think, Jay, I think that the, 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 one of the looming challenges, looming challenges uh, for the uh, global uh, economic community is a lot of these countries are going to have big financing gaps. How are they going to be built? Because the private sector capital flows, as Graciela and I and, and Carlos and many others have also documented, you know, are, 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 are cyclical. So we're after time, so I'm going to have to cut it off at this point. I want to thank everyone and sorry for not reaching your questions, but thank everyone for being part of the event today and particularly our guest, Carmen Reinhardt. Thank you so much for your great insight and for walking the five minutes virtually from the World Bank to, uh, to Elliott School. Uh, we'll see you next time. <laughs>